Welcome back to part two of Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility. Now you will have heard part one and met the characters in our story. A quick reminder, we've got Eleanor Dashwood and Marianne Dashwood, the two sisters, who are both looking to find someone to make them happy. And then there we've got uh, Edward Ferrers and John Willoughby and Colonel Brandon. So three gentlemen that are in the mix. And then a lady who we've not yet met, Lucy Steele. And of course, we've met Sir John Middleton and his mother-in-law, Mrs Jennings, who are matchmaking and trying to find the right man for these ladies. And this children's version of the story is told from the perspective of the younger sister, who's called Margaret. So we turn to section two of this wonderful tale. The following week, the Middletons had a new guest, Lucy Steele. A cousin of theirs was visiting from Plymouth and they were eager to introduce us. At 22 years old, Lucy was beautiful, fashionable and intelligent. Her conversation, however, soon revealed her limitations. You must miss Norland terribly. Had you many beaux there? I always think they are so important. Whilst we all felt that she was a little forward in her question, Mrs Jennings was delighted. Miss Marianne has made an excellent catch since arriving in Barton, she confided. Marianne's face paled. His name is Willoughby and we are sure they will marry soon. Mrs Jennings, we are sure of no such thing, corrected Eleanor, trying to spare Marianne more pain, but unfortunately drawing attention instead to herself. Oh, Eleanor... We have discovered the owner of the initials E.F. Sir John leant over to Lucy. His name is Edward Ferrers, but it is a great secret. Edward Ferrers, exclaimed Lucy. I know him well. She stopped suddenly, then said, That is to say, I've met him once or twice. Something in her face, deceitful and ill-natured, made me suspect that this was not the whole truth. But she refused to tell us anything further about her acquaintance with Edward. Eleanor was not keen to develop her relationship with Lucy, but unfortunately Lucy sought every opportunity to talk to Eleanor. On one occasion I was reading, unnoticed in the corner of the room, when I overheard a conversation that changed my understanding of my sister forever. What do you know of Edward's mother, Mrs Ferrers? asked Lucy. I understand that she wishes for her sons to marry into wealth. I have never met her, replied Eleanor, but I believe that you are right. You probably think my question inappropriate, but Mrs Ferrer's nature is of some importance to me, as we are soon to be related. Are you to marry Edward's brother, Mr Robert Ferrer's? asked Eleanor. Lucy fixed her eye on Eleanor. Not Robert Ferrer's. Edward? gasped Eleanor. She looked at nodding Lucy in disbelief. I feared that she was going to faint. It was always meant to be a great secret, but I'm sure Edward will not mind my telling you. He thinks of you as a sister, you know. For a few moments, Eleanor was silent. I saw her struggle to compose herself before she managed to ask calmly. Has your engagement been long standing? Four years. Four years? We met in Plymouth. Has he not told you of his visits to Plymouth? Eleanor must then have remembered, as did I, that Edward came to us from Plymouth the last time he visited. Are you sure we are talking of the same Mr Ferrers? she asked. Yes. Poor Edward. He suffers so much in our absence from each other. He recently begged a lock of my hair, which he now wears in his ring. He says it helps him to feel that I am always with him. 
It was then that I noticed the similarity in the colour of Eleanor's and Lucy's hair. Sobbing, Lucy talked about the obstacle Mrs Ferris posed to their future happiness. Uncharacteristically, Eleanor did not attempt to comfort her. Do you think it would be better if we broke off our engagement? asked Lucy over her damp handkerchief. In vain, I willed Eleanor to say, break it off. Eleanor remained silent. I hope I have not offended you by confiding in you, said Lucy, her sharp little eyes full of meaning. Eleanor assured her that she was in no way discomforted. Later that day, I found Eleanor crying. Realising that I had overheard the conversation, she made me promise to keep Lucy's secret and to tell nobody else, not even Marianne. Although I am suspicious of Lucy's reasons for confiding in me, she explained, we would be wrong to betray her trust. I listened to Eleanor as she tried to think rationally about Edward's situation. She felt that his engagement to Lucy must be the result of a youthful infatuation. Although confident of his love for her, Eleanor knew that good, honourable Edward would not break off his engagement to Lucy. She wept tears for Edward rather than for herself. He could never be happy with such a wife. Over the following weeks, nobody would have guessed that my admirable big sister's heart was broken into pieces. Anxious to spare Mamma or Marianne any pain, she did everything she could to appear cheerful. Besides, how would she be able to explain her sadness without betraying Lucy? Nevertheless, Eleanor sometimes looked sad. Marianne, however, absorbed in her own grief, failed to notice. I was gradually learning that it is sometimes necessary to control our emotions for the sake of others. In January, Mrs Jennings invited Eleanor, Marianne and me to spend the rest of the winter with her in her London home. Marianne's eagerness to go to London where she might see Willoughby persuaded Eleanor to accept the invitation. After dinner on our first day in London, Marianne ran to her room. I must write to Mamma, she said. Later we saw an envelope addressed to Willoughby. Surely Marianne would only write directly to him if they were engaged. After her letter had been posted, Marianne frequently asked whether there had been any post for her and spent hours sitting expectantly at the window. One clear, cold afternoon, the sound of an approaching horse made Marianne leap from her window seat. Oh, Eleanor, I do believe it is Willoughby. She was to be disappointed again. However, when Mrs Jennings opened the door to Colonel Brandon instead of Willoughby, Marianne ran upstairs weeping. Is your sister ill? inquired Colonel Brandon. She is a little indisposed by the cold, explained Eleanor, anxious to change the subject. Eleanor asked Colonel Brandon about London's weather. Colonel Brandon visited daily. Although he spoke to Eleanor, his eyes gazed at Marianne. His admiration for her was evident. Knowing Marianne's opinion of him, Eleanor and I could not help but feel sympathy. Eleanor's respect for him encouraged me to feel the same. Three more days passed and there was still no sign of Willoughby. An invitation to a party brought life back into Marianne's eyes. Perhaps he will be there, she said excitedly. Too young for a London party, I had to stay at home with Mrs Jennings, desperate to know what was happening. The following morning, I came downstairs early to find Marianne, half-dressed, writing a letter between bursts of grief. I asked Eleanor to explain. Willoughby had indeed been at the ball, and upon seeing him, Marianne had leapt from her seat. Eleanor had had to stop her from rushing to him. Oh, good heavens, Eleanor, he is there, Marianne had cried. Oh, why doesn't he look at me? 
Eleanor told me that Willoughby, who was with a beautiful young lady, was deliberately avoiding catching Marianne's eye. Eventually, he was unable to avoid coming over to talk to them. He addressed them with cold politeness. Good God, Willoughby, cried Marianne emotionally. What is the meaning of this? Have you not received my letters? Tell me, Willoughby, for heaven's sake, what is the matter? Looking very embarrassed, Willoughby bowed and turned hastily away, returning to the young lady's side. Marianne was so distressed that Eleanor had had to bring her home immediately. That afternoon, a letter arrived for Marianne. Eleanor and I felt sick when we saw it. Following Marianne to her room, we found her stretched out on her bed, choked by grief. Oh, Eleanor, wept Marianne, holding out the letter. Willoughby is to be married in a few weeks. He has long been engaged to another. He says he has pleasant memories of our friendship in Devon, and he is sorry if he ever misled me. Silent with disbelief, Eleanor read the letter. He did love me. I know he did, cried Marianne. But you were not engaged, were you? asked Eleanor. No. Oh, Eleanor, I am so miserable, cried Marianne, falling back onto her pillow. Marianne, for everybody's sake and to avoid further gossip, please control your emotions. Oh, Eleanor, how easy it is for you with no sorrow of your own. You cannot understand what I suffer. Leave me, forget me. How can anyone appear to be happy when they are so miserable? Only a sharp look from Eleanor stopped me from saying what I really thought. The following morning, when Colonel Brandon paid his usual visit, Marianne was too upset to come downstairs. Oh, not Colonel Brandon again, she exclaimed. Colonel Brandon was greatly concerned to hear that Marianne was unable to eat or sleep. Usually respectful of Eleanor's silence about the affairs of Marianne's heart, he entreated her to tell him what had happened. When Eleanor had finished, Colonel Brandon looked awkwardly towards me. Taking the hint, I reluctantly went upstairs to see whether Marianne wanted anything. She didn't. When I returned downstairs, the door was open, but I didn't know whether to go back in or not. Colonel Brandon also seemed indecisive. I could see him sitting next to Eleanor. I do not know whether this will offer you any comfort, he said haltingly. If you have something to tell me that will help us to understand Willoughby's character, Eleanor softly encouraged him, then it would be the greatest service to us all for you to say it. Should I leave? Should I knock and enter? Should I stay and wait until he had finished? Feeling as awkward and indecisive as the colonel himself, I found myself listening at the door. The colonel turned to Eleanor. You once asked me whether I was in London on business. I am not. I came to London to help the daughter of a dear friend. I have been responsible for Eliza since her parents' deaths 14 years ago. He looked inquiringly at Eleanor, wondering whether to continue. I found Eliza in great distress. Her innocence had been seduced, false promises made, a child born, and she completely abandoned and disgraced. <gasps> Good heavens! exclaimed Eleanor. Could it be Willoughby? A few weeks passed. Having heard Colonel Brandon's story, Marianne treated him with greater civility. Although she felt some relief that she had escaped Eliza's fate, she still felt wretched. When news arrived that Willoughby had married the wealthy Miss Grey, Marianne realised he was lost to her forever. Even if this dissipated, selfish man had truly loved Marianne, he had always intended to marry for money rather than for love. He was not likely to be happy. Feeling great distress for Marianne, Eleanor ignored her own heartache and offered our sister devoted attention. She was sitting reading to Marianne one morning when Mrs Jennings shrieked with joy, holding an open letter. Ah, our dear Lucy is married to Mr Ferrers, 
she gasped. Oh, how fortunate that you never formed an attachment, Eleanor. Oh, how wonderful for Lucy. Excusing herself, Eleanor left the room. Marianne and I followed her upstairs where we found her sitting quietly at her dressing table. Marianne fell to her knees, weeping. Oh, Eleanor, this cannot be true. Eleanor nodded. Clearly and simply, she told Marianne about her conversations with Lucy. Marianne listened in grief and horror. You mean you have known for four months? During all my misery? And I reproached you for being happy? How have you coped? By feeling that I was protecting you from further distress. Lucy told me about her engagement in confidence, but also in triumph. I had to listen to her boasting over and over again. Surely you now can see that I too have suffered and been very unhappy. Oh, cried Marianne, I hate myself. You in your unhappiness have been my only comfort. What gratitude did I show you? Even in her own distress, Eleanor had to comfort Marianne. She explained her conviction that, although Edward's affection for Lucy had been replaced by love for herself, he had honoured his engagement. Marianne agreed. Edward is the man most incapable of being selfish that I have ever known. He will always keep his word, even if it is against his interest and pleasure. This praise of Edward's character made Eleanor feel her loss still more deeply. That evening, as she and Marianne felt no appetite for food, dinner was not served. This seemed rather unfair, as my appetite was unaffected. Eleanor later told me that she was surprised by the pain this news of Edward was causing her. She thought she had prepared herself for it. We had spent two months in London, during which time so much had changed. Now Marianne was impatient to be home and longed for the quietness of the countryside. Eleanor, no less eager to leave London, planned our journey. We would break the long journey with a week with Mrs Jennings' daughter in Cleveland. Colonel Brandon kindly offered to accompany us all. Cleveland was a spacious house with extensive grounds. Upon our arrival, Marianne rejoiced with tears of pleasure. That evening, she enjoyed a walk through the long wet grass of Cleveland's grounds. It was probably her foolishness in not changing out of her wet clothes that led to her having a dreadful cold the next day. What began as a cold soon developed into a fever and by the third day, Marianne's life was in danger. Pale with concern, Colonel Brandon and Eleanor discussed what to do. It was clear that Mamma had to be sent for. Colonel Brandon offered to travel to Barton himself to ensure her comfort and safety. Whilst the two of them spoke, their heads close together, Mrs Jennings looked from Eleanor to Colonel Brandon and back again. I too began to wonder. I could see her matchmaking mind hard at work again. By the time Mamma arrived the following morning, Marianne's danger had passed. Once reassured that her daughter would make a full, if slow, recovery, Mamma turned her mind to other matters. What an excellent gentleman Colonel Brandon is, she exclaimed. What a noble mind, what openness, what sincerity. He has confided in me that he loves Marianne and I will do everything I can to help him gain her affection. Such a contrast with that Willoughby. Poor Mrs Jennings was most confused. Soon after our return to Barton Cottage during a visit from Colonel Brandon and Mrs Jennings, we received a surprise visitor. We all looked in astonishment as Edward Ferrers, shy and awkward, walked into the room. Although Eleanor's breathing quickened, she politely invited him to join us. Edward took a seat with equal politeness. This calm restraint was unbearable. Why are you here? Is Mrs Ferris in Plymouth? I asked impatiently. They all looked at me and then at Edward. No, uh, my mother is at home. I mean the new Mrs Ferris, I said in exasperation. Surely you know where your wife is. 
Edward's face flushed as he slowly smiled. Ah, you mean my brother's wife, Mrs Robert Ferrers. Now I too fell silent. Eleanor's breathing was the only sound. You clearly have not heard, explained Edward. Lucy Steele is indeed now Mrs Ferrers. She married my brother, Robert. Eleanor squeaked, ran from the room and burst into tears. Edward followed her. When we all sat down to a very pleasant afternoon tea, only three hours after Edward's arrival, he had secured his lady, engaged Mamma's consent, and declared himself the happiest of men. It took Eleanor several more hours to feel truly calm. Marianne seemed satisfied with this degree of emotion. I felt quite dizzy. Mrs Jennings was unusually quiet. That evening, Edward's explanation of his freedom from Lucy met an attentive audience. As Eleanor had suspected, he had been determined to keep his word to Lucy in spite of long ceasing to feel affection for her. When news of their secret engagement had finally reached his mother's ears, she was furious. She immediately cut him out of her will, leaving him with nothing. She would now leave all her money to Edward's younger brother, Robert, who had always been her favourite. Being wealthy, he soon became Lucy's favourite too. Soon afterwards, Lucy had sent a letter to Edward. Robert has now gained my affections entirely, she wrote. We cannot live without one another. We have just got married. This is the first letter I have ever received from Lucy, which has given me pleasure, confessed Edward. Her true nature is exposed and I have had a fortunate escape. My mother will not disinherit Robert. Her fondness for him will overcome her anger. Unfortunately, the news that Eleanor and I to marry will offer her no reason to reclaim me as a son. With a fuller understanding of the qualities of both Eleanor and Edward, I rejoiced at their wedding with all my heart. Colonel Brandon, who highly esteemed them both, offered Edward a living as a clergyman on his estate. Edward and Eleanor were delighted. They now had their snug home and quiet, comfortable life. I cannot believe them entirely without design in their frequent invitations to Marianne to visit them on Colonel Brandon's estate. Time and familiarity increased Marianne's respect for Colonel Brandon. Now at the advanced age of 19, Marianne is discovering the falsehood of her own opinions. Unable to do anything by halves, she has grown to love passionately a man on the wrong side of 35, who occasionally wears a flannel waistcoat. With new happiness in his life, Colonel Brandon's spirits have lifted. Recently, I saw them running together down a hill, and the sound of their laughter reaching Eleanor's cottage. I can't help thinking he's a little too old for such behaviour, but perhaps I'm wrong. Now they all live close together, a short journey away from Barton. As I said at the beginning, we spend a great deal of time there. We will be travelling again tomorrow. Before that, tonight, Sir John Middleton is throwing a party. He is eager to introduce me to a distant cousin of his. And Mrs Jennings is sure that I'll like him. Well, I hope you enjoyed that story. And perhaps when you're older, you'll be able to read the original text, which has lots of funny jokes in it and more characters to get to know. Um, if you'd like to do some of the activities, there are some described in the box below at the bottom. Uh, do subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and I hope to see you soon. Take care. Bye.